the poorest way to face life is to face it with a sneer. There are many men who feel a kind of twisted pride in cynicism. There are many who confine themselves to criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. There is no more unhealthy being, no man less worthy of respect, than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief toward all that is great and lofty, whether in achievement or in that noble effort which, even if it fails, comes to second achievement. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I think that's part of my purpose is to bravely stand in who God made me to be and do that without fear, do that with courage, even when it feels shaky and in order to somehow maybe inspire others to do the same. Guys, tonight you're in for a treat. I don't know if I'm in for a treat, but you certainly are. I've decided to swap roles with Brian Hill. Earlier, probably, I don't know, nine months to a year ago, I did an interview with Brian Hill where he told his story. And it was an incredibly vulnerable interview that I'll never forget. It impacted me so deeply and it inspired me really in so many ways. And so today I've decided to be brave and allow Brian to interview me. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to welcome Brian Hill now as the main host of the show, and I am going to be the guest. Hey, Brian. Hey, how's everybody doing? <laughs> this is really, really awkward. It is. Yeah, but here we are. I, I like what you said about courage, though. And uh, I want you to remember that when you're fearless like this, your, your, your courage will land in some dark part of somebody's soul that needs a little motivation, a little bit of help, uh, somebody to model. And uh, that's why you're doing it. And it's going to be a wonderful opportunity. And you may never see the benefits in, in, in the same way that you do with your show, but this is important. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for interviewing me. I, I told you earlier, I'm not sure if I should thank you or <laughs> curse you, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I would land in the middle of that. I think it's a good place to be with me. Well, I trust you, Brian. So that's really important, I think, in this process, because if I'm going to be really vulnerable, I, I know that I need a, a safe place to do that. And maybe it's an illusion of safety, but I'm still going to do it. Nevertheless, it does matter. That's that's why I did the interview with you is that 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 confidence that the other person will do what's in your best interest. Yeah, you know, that's important. It, it may not always be the easiest, but we'll do what is in each other's best interest. OK, <laughs> good. You ready to get started? <laughs> uh, yes. So, yeah. Are you going to you know, do a, are you going to do an introduction of me? What would my introduction be? <laughs> well, I can do my personal introduction of what I've seen and why we're at this point. Uh, you know, yeah. I'd like to introduce to you guys Laura Thurston, who I think is one of the rising talents in the firearms industry. 
And the reason I say that is she's a singular voice and it's not because she's young or she's female, but she's actually started to occupy a space that's well needed. And she's finding what high level performers need to not only succeed, but to thrive and learn how to overcome their struggles in their context. And she's done a wonderful job in putting a, a show together that allows people to see this side of her. She's an accomplished firearms instructor. Uh, she's a fitness, what, what will we call you, a fitness connoisseur now. I think you're at, at that point where you're really starting to uh, engage in how to improve not only your physical fitness, but your mental fitness. Uh, and you love to shoot. You love your family. You love people around you. And I find you to be a singularly unique voice. And I think unique voices need a platform to be heard. It's a great honor to have and spend time with you and to be your friend and to have the trust that you put in me to interview in, you, in this situation. Wow. Thank you. How's that for an intro? So, yep. It feels weird, doesn't it? Yeah, very. I think this is good, though, right? It's this even worse weird. when you have to introduce yourself, I think. You've yeah. talked about that. I think it's, you know, this is a good place, too, where you remember what it's like to be on the other side of this. You know? Right. And we both get to see that in this moment. And, uh, the changing of roles and changing of positions, changing of perspective is incredibly important for growth. So. New level of uncomfortable unlocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel for you, my friend. I feel for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, why don't we get to work? OK. As always, uh, you know. It's interesting, and we're going to talk about this in the show, I know, about the struggle. And the struggle to get started is always real. Uh, no matter how much you want to do something right now, there's a procrastination, there's a struggle going on because your brain's ramping up and it's getting ready to do it. And we find that continually in life. And one of the great things that human beings really need to have is a sense of purpose. It allows mm -hmm. us to overcome this inability, this imposter syndrome, this, this struggle to get started. And when we find our purpose, it's usually bigger and larger than we are. Therefore, we forget how little we are and how important the purpose is. So my first question to you is, what is your purpose? I know it's changed, I know it's evolved, and I hope you'll, you'll talk about how it has changed over time uh, and with your experience, but I think it's very interesting. You found a unique purpose, so let's talk about that first. Well, I think it would be important to preface what I'm going to say during the interview. Um, with a lot of my journey, especially recently, has been due to spiritual growth on my part. And so what I will talk about will be my honest experience with God. And I know that's not everyone's experience. And um, I respect that. I would just hope that if what I say lands a little bit uncomfortable to you, that you'll be open minded enough to hear the message rather than words that might trigger you for some reason. The reason I say that is because there have been times previous to me becoming a believer where I would hear someone start to talk about Jesus or God, and I would just honestly be annoyed. I would just roll my eyes and I would just think, oh my gosh, not again. You know, here we go. Someone preaching, you know, and it's, and then I found it to be very uncomfortable and annoying. And it was hard for me to hear the message behind that. Um, because of the package it was wrapped in, if that makes sense. I, I felt, um, I mean, I've been struggling with this interview for that reason. Um, speaking openly about uh, my faith is hard for me. My faith is not always widely accepted or viewed in the same way that I view it. So my purpose in all of this um, is just to try to reach people through my experience and, and that common humanness that we all experience. And so speaking of my purpose, then I would say now I found more clarity. My purpose revolves around a belief that I used to have, which was that this vulnerableness that I possess, this humanness that I possess was a curse instead of a blessing. And I believe that for a really long time because that's what the world told me, the people around me in not so many words told me that what I was experiencing and feeling and my um, portrayal of that into the world made them feel uncomfortable. And so that was tamped down for, very long, for a very long time and I hated that about myself for a really long time. And now I have learned that that is a blessing for other people because I've now experienced, even recently, people come up to me 
and thank me for showing emotion because in some way it's allowed them permission or inspiration to do the same. I'm not sure, but that floored me because that's been a part of me forever. So I think that's part of my purpose is to bravely stand in who God made me to be and do that without fear, do that with courage, even when it feels shaky and in order to somehow maybe inspire others to do the same. You know, it's funny how often the word fear comes up when we Mm -hmm. talk about, uh, you know, spiritual growth, mental growth, Mm -hmm. physical growth. Uh, Mm -hmm. What got you to the point where you could face your fears? It's never easy. I know. And you're you're not without fear. Right. You you wouldn't want to be that way. But what got you to the point where it was worth it? I think that there have been many times in my life where I've really felt alone. Mm -hmm. And my faith now has proven to me that I'm not. And not just not alone in that God um, is with me but not alone in that other people experience the exact same feelings and thoughts. When I remember that and I know I'm not alone, then I don't buy into the lies anymore because I know the truth. So that helps suffer inside our own heads. Don't we? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a battleground. I think that's why your, your particular brand of courage right now is so important. Uh, You know, there's, I can't tell you, I just imagine people listening are going to resonate with that. You know, the, the, the fear of being rejected by the group, but the other sense of loneliness mm. that we have, you know, and, um, you know, when you found a purpose, this allows you to grow and allows you to face those things. But uh, it's so hard. It's so much easier to be the opposite, isn't it? Oh, but it's yeah. so painful in the end. Yeah. You know? But there's a cost for that. Yes. There's a cost for staying comfortable. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think the ultimate cost for being comfortable is? I think it is. I think it's almost in some ways betraying the gift, the gifts that God gave you that you should be showing into the world because the world needs us. The world needs me. The world needs you. Everyone has something so unique to bring. And I see people holding themselves back to such degrees because of fear. But I see deep inside those people. I see, I would, I want to say, I see what God sees, but I see that potential. I see that spark and that fire and that passion hidden underneath all of that doubt and shame and fear. And, um, and it it makes my heart sad sometimes to see that, but that's the cost for hiding. And I know as a coach, I've seen great lights extinguished for no reason, you know, and that, that, that is, seems to be the biggest waste I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, that sheltering of, of what you could be, what Mm -hmm. you really are, what Mm -hmm. you should be Mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult. And Mm -hmm. the avoidance of feeling uncomfortable with it is such a small portion of this, you know? Yeah. But if, if warriors like you and I don't talk about it and don't show people how hard it genuinely is, um, how will people know to move forward? You know, it's, it's so easy to desensitize yourself and just try to be comfortable. But we know the end result of that is there's, you know, people are unhappy, discontented. So I congratulate you on finding purpose. It's a it really a gratifying thing. Yeah, it is so worth it. It is. You know, what we're talking about today is the intrinsic motivators of human beings. And that's how I frame my questions. So what what does motivate us? What allows us to get up and and overcome the hard days? Yeah. The easy days are easy for a reason, right? <laughs> This is one of the hard days and you're, you're doing a fantastic job. You know, it's uh, I, I, to watch you and to feel the, you know, the deep well of empathy and love. That's incredible. You know, and uh, it's so easy to let that go and to be cynical and, and yeah, just make excuses. And yeah. So well done on the first question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big question, Brian Hill. That is maybe one of the biggest questions. I'm like, mm-hmm. how can you lead with that? <laughs> but how can That's, you not, though? I know, you know, right? I know. Yeah. You know, uh, it's it's always been interesting to me. We talk about imposter syndrome a lot in this industry mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. people often have to teach without an apprenticeship phase, you know, so they don't really get enough growth. Sometimes they just have to do the job. Sometimes yeah. you're called to do the thing yeah. and you never feel like you're quite ready for it, no matter who you are. And one of the ways to get around the imposter syndrome is to have purpose. Mm. It's, it's not you. 
Right. It's bigger than you. you. Yeah. You're doing it for others. You're in service. That's exactly right. And I've always found Jesus to be one of the greatest teachers. He didn't teach those who were worthy. Yeah. He went to all the places where everybody said he shouldn't go. Yeah. And he was passionate. And he met people where they are. That's right. Yeah. And that's 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 a big insight. You know, that's yeah. a, that's a big difference. And that's how, you know, you're in the right place because you'll feel it. And we've talked yeah. about it when you're teaching. It's as something bigger than you is happening. Mm-hmm. It's and powerful. That's our limited connections. Yeah. Well, that leads us into our next question. <laughs> you know? You're such and a good I, interviewer, Brian. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's easy, you know, uh, <sighs> because I, I respect and love and care about you. And I know where you're going and. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're doing something important. You can feel it. Yeah. And I know you can too. Yeah. You know? And the easy work is always easy. You know, I could talk about pistols all day long. But it's right. Easy. Right. This is the stuff that matters. And if you don't know who you are, how are you going to win? You know, the fight that's coming for you every day. So my next question is, I have to be careful because this language sometimes gets confused with people, but I ask you what you're passionate about in teaching and training in life. But I also want to ask what are the feelings associated with it? You know, sometimes when we mm. use the word passionate, it, you know, it's like a Harlequin romance novel. You know, yeah. we think that's passion, but that's not yeah. truly what it is. Passion is the fuel that gets us up, the yeah. fuel that gets us through. And we are emotional creatures. You know, as much as we want to be logical, uh, the emotions drive us, you know. So yeah. my question is, what are your passages about passion about teaching and life and training? And what does that feel like? What does real passion feel like when you're when you're doing these things? Mm. A real passion feels like. It feels like um, fulfillment. It feels uh, there's a feeling, a filling up. Um, it's a to me when I think about passion, I think about substance. When I can, when I, when there's something of real substance, because I'm often disappointed with the shallowness uh, that I see. I'm not saying there's not a time and place for certain things. There always is in life. I get that, but. Um, I get excited when I can dig really deep and I can see people for who they really are. And when they say something, I can see past what they're saying to what they really mean. I struggle with that too. That's one of my, uh, I wouldn't know. I don't, I mean, I don't even really know if it's true, honestly, but um, at least one of the th- stories I tell myself is that, is that I have a hard time articulating what I really mean. And I don't think that's actually true. I think sometimes um, other thoughts get in the way because I I ping pong sometimes. Um, But what makes me passionate is the truth. What makes me passionate is digging, seeking, um, finding the true essence of people that uh, that makes me excited. I oftentimes describe it as being like a Jack Russell Terrier digging in a hole after a gopher or something like there is that drive in me that just like a Jack Russell, that's just part of how God made that particular (laughs) animal. Right. And that's how God made me. And so that's where the passion comes is like, is digging and finding new things, learning new things, exploring new things, not just about myself, but about other people. And then part of the process of revealing that to them is also exciting to me. And I happen to do that as a firearms instructor, which sounds really odd to some people, I think, but I haven't found yet in in a class that through somehow the process of shooting a gun, a person doesn't reveal who they really are. They might be hiding it, but it's there. Whenever I'm very observant about that, I think that's my strong intuition that that feeds that when I really tap into that and I really pay attention in a way that's not shallow, but in a way that's more deeply felt and seen, then I'm able to help that person in a way that's actually meaningful to them and not just telling them the next step to do. Do you often feel like you're stripping things away instead of teaching things? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because you talked about your own filter and I think everybody has filters and that's mm-hmm. a comparison whether I should or shouldn't do something. You know, when you're when you have integrity, and you trust your intuition, and you're genuine and we start seeing who the real person is. Mm-hmm. So if we take something like firearms, is that a chance for us to reveal a very small portion of how mm-hmm. the person really acts and things? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that in a way, the how I show up with that person in some way again, helps them in some way to reveal that about themselves. And and it's not anything that's spoken necessarily. It's, it's just that somehow they trust me and they know that 
that I'm their advocate, just like you're an advocate for people. I think people sense that they know that and that allows them, you know, to explore things in a different way without their guard being up and without openness to new information. Is your passion calm? Calm? Yeah. Um, well, it's a good question. I know that's a hard one, isn't it? At times it can be when yeah. needed. There's times where that's needed. There can be a a passionate calmness, which sounds like an oxymoron, but there can be. I, I don't think that it ever really truly goes away. So I think maybe it's an ebb and flow type situation where there's times where I'm just so fired up that I can't hold it back. You know, like when I do the happy dance on the line, like there's just so much in me that has to come out physically. Right. Um, but I can still be passionate and be calm. Yeah, that's that's needed. Does it ever sometimes. feel like a hurricane now? A little bit. Um, I think it doesn't feel uncontrollable in a bad way. It's a release more than anything. It's like a wave and a release. And I've learned to not um, hold that back. I've learned to embrace that more now instead of instead of looking at it and judging it. Right. Or worrying about what other people think of that of that of my reaction to that passion or how I express it. I've found that more often than not, other people are inspired by it. They're excited by it. They love seeing it. And that's um, encouraging for me because, again, I've, I've really been I haven't been good at, but I've tried to be good at holding it back for years. But I haven't been good at it at all. <laughs> I don't think you can, you know. No, nor should I be. And it, it's funny. People feel very guilty about showing joy sometimes. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll really criticize themselves. But joy is very difficult and hard, you know. And you, like you talked about your happy dance, you know, it's, that's joy yeah. establishing itself. Yeah. It's energy, isn't it? It's energy. Yeah. And that, I think the reason I held that back in the past was because I was afraid that it would make other people uncomfortable. I was more worried about other people than I was myself. I don't feel like I need to do that anymore. Good. Language is clunky with this stuff, isn't it? It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't have good words for this sometimes. Um, you know, and it's funny, we'd all rather be miserable together. <laughs> right yeah you know when it comes to joy so i think that's a that's a good way to do, i've seen the joy of your learning and the joy of your teaching you know and yeah. i think that's a people have to know that that's where the real fulfillment is yeah you know that's how the purpose fulfills and i want that for other joy. people i want that for other people that's a really strong desire of mine the thing is is like you can't change other people you can't you can't get them to a place they don't want to go you can't make them see something they don't want to see so the only thing i can do is be a good example that's the conclusion I've come to, um, at least as of late. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, but um, that's what I'm trying to do is the very, the last thing I want to do is talk on my show about how important X, Y, Z is and be a complete hypocrite behind the scenes. <laughs> that would just feel so wrong to me. So I think that's probably part of my motivation, too, is living up to, you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And the walk is not easy. It's not easy at all. Nope. If you're new or watching this as a replay, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Please subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, and consider, if you're able, to become a paid subscriber on defenders-live.com. Your support is the only way I'm able to continue doing this labor of love. And also, if you're looking for exceptional firearms and self-defense training, go to defenders-usa.com and look at the calendar to see what's coming to your area this year. Hey guys, I would like to invite you to something new that I'm offering. I am going to be hosting a live Zoom call once a month for my paid subscribers. I really want to offer something special, something valuable, and something with a personal touch to you every month. And this is my way of helping you guys on your journey and what you can expect is a variety of different topics all within four buckets that i talk about on defenders live which are health and well-being mental and emotional health spiritual fitness and self-defense so once a month i am going to be presenting some questions to you um, during that zoom call we're going to have a conversation live and uh there's a good chance that uh the founder of defenders usa adam winch might be on that call as well 
well. So I invite you to join me on the Defenders Live community. As a paid subscriber, you will be getting emails about these once a month. You can sign up for this by going to defenders-live.com and becoming a paid subscriber. I hope to be talking to you soon and seeing you in the live Zoom calls. Thank you so much for your support of Defenders Live. But what are you seeking mastery in? And when I use the term mastery, I mean yeah. anything. You know, yeah. I don't think you do it one thing at a time anyway. So what are you seeking mastery in? Well, I think in my mind, the idea of mastery is unattainable. Um, at least it feels that way to me right now. And I think that if I ever really mastered something, it wouldn't be interesting to me anymore anyway. So the the things that I seek to master right now are multifaceted. <laughs> it is, it's all the things. Again, I think that's part of who I am and I can't, um, I would be lying if I said it was just one thing or another. I mean, so many things interest me. So for me, um, seeking understanding in physical fitness is a big thing for me. And I, but I want to say the reason for that isn't so that I'm jacked. The reason for that is because I found, I found, um, another it's it's been an, a process for me of revealing who i am to myself it's been a real honest journey that i i find really fulfilling because nobody else is around me when i'm working out it's just me i think that scares some people but i embrace that time and um you know, an example of seeking that mastery in physical fitness for me has been like the clean has been my nemesis and rope climbs have been my nemesis. I have more than one. But um, what I found is that showing up even when you don't feel competent in something, which is most of the things I do, especially in physical fitness, because it's not I don't see myself naturally good at it. Um, but the process of showing it up and doing it messy the process of showing up and admitting, I don't understand this. I don't really know how to do this, but I'm going to try. I'm going to be willing to try and it's going to, I'm going to fail and it's going to suck and it's going to feel gross and icky. Like all the things in your gut that are just like, again, the voices in your head that say, who do you think you are? You've never done this before. You can't do this. And then setting those aside and being like, well, actually I'm here and I'm open and I'm willing and I'm not perfect, and I'm just going to try. The magic is, is that if you just keep showing up with that humbleness every single day, then one day you're going to land that clean or you're going to climb that rope almost effortlessly, and you're going to go, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Because it's such a minute such a small change every single day that you don't see, you don't recognize. And then when it shows up, I just feel like, wow, I just, I've just proven that if I just, now that's what putting in the work actually is, Brian. I think people think putting in the work every day means like, you know, giving yourself 10 lashes and like running uphill both ways, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> like, that's not it. The work is, is not always like this grinding, you know, intense thing. Sometimes it's a quiet, humble thing. You're like, here I am. I'm going to show up and do my best today. I'm going to do a little bit today. And over time that adds up like in big ways. And then a year from now, for me, a year from when I started, I've grown in ways, not physically is like the byproduct of it, emotionally, mental strength. That's what I've learned in that showing up process. That's the true work. It's not the lift the heavy thing. That's like the conduit for the real work for me. And that's that's part of the physical. Then the, then the mental and emotional comes along with that. In fact, I would say it might even be a bigger component than the physical. That's why I say the physical is a byproduct. And then for me, the spiritual mastery, which again, is impossible. There's no such thing for me, I don't think, ever in this lifetime, is this, again, showing up with discipline, with humbleness, realizing I don't know what I don't know, but I'm willing. 
I want to learn. There's so much I don't know. And I'm not even going to pretend to. All I have is my personal experience. And, um, but I'm excited to share that with others because how I thought this might go and how it actually went are completely different. And it's messy. You know, it's not mastery to anything isn't isn't linear. It's messy. It is it is painful. It is unpredictable. It's it's yeah, like an example would be yesterday when I realized this interview was coming up. I noticed that I went into freeze mode. I mean, almost to the point where I stopped breathing. I think I held my breath for a period of time when the reality of it hit me. And instead of allowing myself to spiral into a default pattern that I used to do, I stopped and noticed it for what it was. And I went, wow, you're really having a response to that fear, you know? And I, and I paid attention to what was I saying to myself in that moment what were those voices saying? And then ask myself, is that true? Mostly it wasn't true. I reached out to a couple friends who know me really well. And um, that was needed because others see you differently than you see yourself. And um, I let it um, sort of derail me for a, for a while. I didn't go do my normal workout at my normal time. And then towards the end of the day, after I'd done a lot of other kinds of work, but not physical fitness work, it was late in the evening and I had a choice. Am I going to show up? There's still time. There's still time to show up. Oh God, it was the last thing I wanted to do though. I was so tired, exhausted emotionally and mentally. And um, I hadn't eaten very well. I was having trouble. (laughs) Like, I've had trouble the last two days just eating because this has been such a big deal to me. And um, I did it anyway. Well, that leads us to our next question. <laughs> perfect. You know, it's, yeah. it's perfect because now we've done the first three, which is purpose and passion and mastery. And then is the next motivator is autonomy. How do you mm. get yourself to do these things? Mm. You know, first, you've eloquently talked about the struggle. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. How do you seek that self-improvement? How do you get started? Mm. Uh, is it okay to procrastinate like you did? Yeah. You know, uh, why is it messy? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that as much as this sounds like me doing this all by myself, that's not the case. I can't do this by myself. Um, I have proven that to my, <laughs> I've proven that over and over throughout my life, which is probably why I have struggled so much with it because I've always prior to this had the belief that you got to just suck it up and do it yourself, you know? And there are times where you do, but asking for help is really important. And it, for me, is incredibly difficult. Why is it so difficult? Most of my um, growing up, showed me or implanted the idea that you're on your own. You don't really have a choice. You got to figure it out yourself. Nobody's going to come for you. Nobody's going to save you. Nobody's going to even want to help you. You know, like the idea, the, the belief that you're not, you're not worthy of that. You're not, you're not good enough for somebody to come Nobody's coming. What helped you see through that falsehood? Hmm. I think, um, again, learning through my faith now that I'm not alone was helpful. I believe the people that I surround myself with mostly show me God's love. God is seen through people. Love is seen through people. And... I've had too many experiences over the last few years where people have shown up for me and in big ways and show me love in ways I didn't even think I deserved. And so I think, well, that can't be true then. I've been proven wrong, basically. (laughs) Yeah. And that's powerful. Um, But so, yeah. 
I have, I consider a team of people behind me, like a, like an army of people behind me. Now I have the support of my husband, of my kids. I have, um, I have mentors like you and Adam who see things in me. I don't see in myself who continually challenge me, which is needed challenging my old, you know, patterns, my old thoughts. Is that really true? Um, I have friends that I just referred to who've shown me love that I almost don't know what to do with all the love. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, at first it was really uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do with that. So that's needed. <sighs> you know, it's funny that the, you know, it's, it's an old Bible quote too, but the truth shall set you free. And the problem mm -hmm. is most of us don't want to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's not available to us. We just don't want to see the truth, even though the world continually proves our falsehoods to be lies. Right, right. Because, you know, as we talked about, it's more comfortable to suffer alone sometimes. And Yeah, uh, it is sometimes. Yeah, because I didn't want to be a burden to other people. That was my right. big thing. Yeah. So I just suffered alone. And uh, we're talking about enriching each other, aren't we? Instead yeah. of being burdens. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's I a mean, huge, huge pattern override. That's just a wonderful bit of progress. Scary, too, I know. Yeah, I still struggle with it. Mm -hmm. I still struggle with it. I mean, what I've noticed is the more that I've explored, I call them the deep, deep dark caves. The more I explore mm -hmm. the deep, dark caves and shed light in those areas, um, the more that the voices, I call them the voices, weaken, which are the lies. The lies weaken. They're still there, but... I don't feel like I have to listen to them anymore because they aren't me. So it's kind of cool. I'm proud of you. Thanks. You're doing, you're doing, you know, it's such incredible hard work. And it's funny though, the more you react to things now, the more, you know, you need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth of it. Yes. So if you're ever wondering what's the next step in my growth, it's the thing that scares you. It's the thing you don't want to face. That's the thing. That's the next thing. And for me, the thought of the thing, whatever it was that scared me, was way bigger than it actually was in reality. Still scary, still hard, still really uncomfortable. But once that light was shed on it, it like somehow that light dissipates it in a way that makes me see it, see the truth, see what it really is. And the more I do that, that's the process of being uncomfortable. But the more that I do that, the more confidence I have that I can keep doing that. And that's what that was another thing I wanted to say is that through this self-improvement, self-discipline arena, one of the biggest things I've learned is whether it's now I'm going to use this in a physical fitness term, like showing up for, for your workout or whatever. But this is showing up for anything that you're dreading, that that you're procrastinating about. For me, if I say to myself, Laura, go put your shoes on. Just start there. Just go put your shoes on. Get dressed. That's not hard, right? And it starts that tiny little snowball of, okay, I can do that. Because for me, I would get overwhelmed by the mountain. I would be looking at the mountain and going, I can't do that. I don't have that in me today. It's too much. I'm overwhelmed. And then say or justify or think of all the ways that I can't do that or why I can't do that or excuses. And um, and now it's put your shoes on. You've got work to do. You have a mission here. You know, there's a real sense of mission for me. And it starts with putting my shoes on. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. That's insightful. It's helped me. It's helped me so much. Get to work. Yeah. Just start. I, I well, feel we, like we, that's so hard for some people. Well, you're, you're you're following the path really well, you know, and we've gotten through four of these. And the final one is curiosity. You know, when you get to the point where you're courageous, you become more curious, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what you start feeling. So and this is this is a lighter question than what we just went through, you know, <laughs> uh, but what are you curious about? Brian, it might be easier to ask what I'm not curious about. No. I like that answer. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question for me to answer because. Well, like in teaching, what are you curious about or interviewing? You know, what is what is something that strikes you that you see over and over that maybe needs Laura's attention? Well, I am really curious about vulnerability. It is it's an animal that is not it's like the curiosity is like an elk in the, you know, in the mountains. Like you're like, did I just see that? Oh, wait, 
it's like your heart just stops for a second. <gasps> this, this, this like intangible thing, like, wow, look at that. Because it's so rare, you know? True vulnerability is so rare I, for me anyway. I don't see a lot of it in our everyday social media and, you know, living our lives. And I, all I see are walls and facades and, and how I want to be in the world, what I want people to know and see about me and hiding all the things that I don't think are, you know, the parts of me that, that scare me or that might um, scare off others perhaps, you know? And um, so I'm curious whenever I see that in people, or you just see a little, a little tiny bit of that because usually it comes in small doses <laughs> mm -hmm. um that's to me um that's a door opening do you think that we have a problem with vulnerability because we try to avoid failure constantly i can relate to that mm -hmm. yeah yeah part of my path has been avoiding failure most of my life my path um huh, this is really good for people to hear i uh suffered from uh, perfectionism, I still struggle with it. Perfectionism is is a nasty thing. I used to wear it like a badge of honor. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a nasty thing that can sabotage you in ways you don't realize. You know, somebody told me recently that God has you on a mission, Laura, and you don't have to be perfect. He knows you're not perfect. You just have to be willing. And that really strikes me. Because I'm always willing. You know? But um, yeah, I think I think perfection is the inability to learn, though, because learning yeah. comes from failure. Yes. It always will. Yes. And that's, you know, and it kills our curiosity, too. That's mm -hmm. the real problem with perfection. If it just exists and it is, and therefore yeah. it has to be. Yeah. You know, if you're avoiding failure, you're, you're avoiding learning. If you're avoiding failure, you're playing it too safe. Yeah. You're playing it safe. You're playing life safe. And um, I don't think life's meant to be lived that way. Not you fully lived. you a risk taker? <laughs> I don't think, uh, I think I'm working on that. How about that? I don't think my uh, nature has been to be a risk taker necessarily. It's funny because I think some people view me that way because I'm doing things that they couldn't imagine doing themselves. But the only reason I'm able to do any of this is because I put my shoes on and I showed up. Mm -hmm. Like I showed up for my first podcast, messy and imperfect and not having a clue what I was doing. <laughs> I showed up the first day to gun training my very first gun class, no clue what I was doing, right? I mean, we all start somewhere. But the thing, the thing is, you have to start. You have to start. <laughs> you, you can't go on a journey if you don't begin the journey. So, I'm going to say that to myself. I got to go put my shoes on. I like it. Yeah. yeah. It's simple. Take the first step. Yeah. All right. The question I've been waiting to answer you this not an intrinsic motivator, but. I, 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 I've seen another interviewer do this, and I think it's a brilliant question. And, uh, you know, I've seen it over and over that, you know, how you gauge interest in people is you ask them questions that they're interested in answering. Mm. So my one question to you is, what is one question you would enjoy answering? You know? That's, that's hard for me to know. So what do you find joy in? I think that I find joy in um, in somehow revealing to other people that that they're okay that that they can do this too like you've said before you don't have to be special to be great and it's so true i'm not special i'm very ordinary i'm very flawed and um i find joy in in showing that to people in different ways um uh, because maybe the joy i really find is seeing people blossom into who God really made them to be or stepping into that and finding their own purpose. That brings me joy. Like you want to talk about fired up like that. <laughs> that's where it's at for me. And so I think, how can I, how can I help people do that? Well, then let me ask you this question. How can an instructor do that with their students? We know it's not technical development. How do we, get to that point of, you know, people often say, oh, I like to see the light bulb go on and things like that. But yeah, it's a small fraction of what's really happening. Right. You know, what's something that you do that allows you to make that connection 
and let somebody see themselves better. It's hard to put a finger on because mm-hmm. I feel like that's, I feel like God works through me in those moments. And I'm, I become sort of in a sense, a conduit, like a messenger, if you will. I don't feel like it's something that I consciously think about in the moment. Obviously I must have thoughts, but so you let me try yourself to when you do it. Yeah. I embrace it fully. Let me try to think of something more concrete to be helpful to people. I think the first step in that process for me was really trying to relax and take the focus off of myself in the, how do I look when I say this? What's the next thing I need to teach? And paying more close attention, being really observant of what's going on, what's really going on here. I don't think everyone can do that. Um, Maybe that can be learned. For me, it comes pretty natural, I think. Did you ever have to work with things that didn't speak language, like horses? Yeah. You had to pay close attention to them? Yeah. So do you think it was natural and maybe possibly a learned behavior? Could be. You know, the, the, the reason I ask that is we often have a lot of patterns in our life that we don't recognize. Yeah. You know, like, uh, you know, we have horses, too. And in order to be good with horses, you have to be honest. You know, the horse has to know what you want. You have to be honest with the way and you can't use words. You can talk, but yeah. they don't really care about the words. They care about the actions. And then I hear from you over and over. And we talked about it the other day, how you're starting to see the bigger pattern. Mm. That it reflects whether you're doing physical fitness or you're doing spiritual growth or you're teaching someone. That the pattern is ultimately the same because everything that we teach is to human beings. And we've seen these patterns over and over. And if we trust ourselves to do the right thing and put the other person's success forward. Yeah. We're there. Yeah. And we don't, we don't, I want to caution some people because I've done this in the past too. I don't think we get people where they need to be by having an agenda for them and then micromanaging them into that agenda. That it, That is not helping people. It's really not. It's the meeting them where they are and listening more than speaking. Listening is the key component. And when I say listening, you know, I listen for God's voice. I know what God's voice sounds like. And, but I also listen to what people are saying to me. And again, the underlying meaning of what they're really saying. And that doesn't mean that I'm like super philosophical or that I'm highly intellectual and that I'm so smart that I understand what people really mean. It's not, it's not an intellectual thing at all. It is a human relationship with another human who's experienced things that you've experienced and seeing that pain in them seeing that hurt in them, seeing that struggle in them, identifying that in yourself and saying to that person, I'm here, you're not alone. You know, that's what it is. That's what it is. You know, I I believe it was Morgan Freeman, but I could be wrong. And he made this analogy and he said, God is not a gumball machine. No, (laughs) You don't put a quarter in and get gumballs. No, no. You sit and listen. You know, that's what you just said that, for you, prayer is listening. For for you, teaching is listening. Yeah. And, uh, you know, living your right life is listening to what's happening. And I think yeah. that's profoundly different than most of the industries teaching. Here's your curriculum. Here's your technique. Here's how you do it. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's one of the reasons I, 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 I honor you. I support you. I call you a friend because I watch you do this with people, you know, and I think it's a brilliant and wonderful thing. And, and to hear the words come out of your mouth is a, a particular honor. And I think, you know, as hard as that question was to answer, you just did it wonderfully. And now you're probably not sure what you said, right? (laughs) Not exactly. You spoke from the heart. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's, that's, that's the harder thing to do sometimes, you know, having a glib answer is easy, but, you know, paying attention and meeting the person where they were and listening is what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm so grateful for that gift. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you've helped me see that, too. I've watched you do the same thing in in a class. And um, you know it when you see it, you know, mm-hmm. you feel it. So that's uh, that's powerful stuff. It is. Yeah. That's good work, as they say. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think that's what we've done now is good work. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I'm really relieved that I mm-hmm. that I did this. I feel like the timing of it was, was right. Honestly, this has been one of my biggest fears for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure what I was even afraid of, (laughs) but um, 
I just really hope that other people not just hear what we're talking about, but really, really explore it for themselves, you know, and try to understand it and, and live it. You were very courageous to do this. You know, <sighs> it's, yeah. it's hard. It always is will hard. be. Yeah. You know, it's always will be, but it was a great deal of courage and it required most of the work you did to get to this point. Nobody will get to see. Mm, that's OK. You know? Yeah. And uh, there was there was plateaus and there were setbacks. Yeah. And, uh, none of it was linear. And no, uh, you just had to do the work. And, I, you know, so we're all going to put our shoes on and get to work, according to Laura, from now on, you know, yeah. take that first step. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. It was my honor and my pleasure. And uh, thank you to your community for letting me step in and do this because uh, everybody needs to know Laura well. She's a, she's a, a good human being, as many of you are. And uh, oftentimes a person does a job and nobody really knows how good they are at their job, including mm -hmm. the person. And this was our chance to see what makes Laura tick. <laughs> how did she get here, you know? And uh, as we all know, it's kind of a mess. It's a mess. Know? It's it's but that's that's where the good work is. And I, as I tell people, I can never offer you happiness, but I can offer you contentment because that's what we really require is that we've we've done something difficult and painful. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this, we both feel very content that we put our best effort forward and we probably yeah. stumbled a couple times, but yeah. we're OK with that. Yeah, because we're not perfect vessels. Yep. Well said. Yeah, I'm feeling for you. deep breaths all right guys you are in for a treat I'm not sure if i'm in for a treat but you certainly are uh i don't remember uh i don't know if you remember our uh, okay apparently murphy has landed murphy murphy's law yes i have a whole platoon of them since you know i'm part irish they travel with me i'm part irish too yeah irish english and danish which is all the same shit really <laughs> Since the Danes conquered half of England and Irish, uh, Ireland, so you'd never know from the coloring, though. What don't you know, Brian? Uh, everything I don't know. <laughs> Me too. to be a lot. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it's like the older I get, the more I realize how much I don't know. That's, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I think so. Are you okay? I'm good. I'm now set. Okay. It's not going to fall down. We're in good place. I got my keyboard out, so we're back to Apple. So all is well. Hang on, let me let me do a little maintenance here. <laughs> there we go. Looks a lot better now. So. By the way, I don't appreciate your questions at all. No, not even a little bit. Very little. I thought I thought they were really brilliant. They are very brilliant. Yes, they are. I think I went right to the places you didn't want to go. So exactly, I, you know. you're really good at that. <laughs> I'm not sure whether to thank you or curse you, but uh, I, I'm sure there's a bit of both. Afterwards, <laughs> maybe thank. Right now, a lot of cursing, right? Oh, I'm gonna say how I really feel on this interview. So, oh, I have no doubt. You be yourself. My brain's an interesting thing sometimes. Aren't brains interesting things? Yeah. I got notes in front of me, so if you say something interesting, we can circle back to it. Oh, this is weird. It is weird, isn't it? It's so backwards. It's uh, so much easier on this side. 